have seen something about Bitcoin a few years back. It sounded revolutionary. This was going to replace the banks. It was permissionless, decentralized, peer-to-peer electronic cash. No one can take it from you. You can send any amount for less than a penny fast. But damn, the price was $100, and it would probably fail anyways. So you better play it safe and see what happens. Then you saw the price recently on the news, $15,000. And immediately your stomach dropped because you realized that how rich you could have been. But you blew it. But you realize that it's still going up fast. And if you invest now, you're probably still on the ground floor. When you finally get your Bitcoin, after waiting five hours for it to confirm, you realize that some is missing. Turns out that your small investment of $30, $15 went towards the transfer fee to put it in your wallet. This is what was going to change the world? Let me fill you in on what happened while you were gone. Transaction fees have risen because of the block size. The block size is one megabyte currently and only allows for a few transactions per second to take place. Many more happen than this, so the people who pay the highest fee get to go first in line. On December 12, 2017, at the time I'm recording this video, the average transaction fee today was $24.40. This problem only gets worse with time and as adoption spreads. Instead of raising the block size again, the development team has decided to go for a second layer called the Lightning Network. It promises instant transactions, super low fees, and this is the basics of how it works. Let's say me and you transact regularly, so we open a channel for two Bitcoins. I send a Bitcoin and you send a Bitcoin to a multi-signature address where it's temporarily locked away. Now we are free to trade two Bitcoins back and forth with no fees, as long as we both sign each transaction. This is because the actual Bitcoin was never moved. We are essentially trading for the rights of the coin, off-chain, similar to an IOU. When we close our channel, it settles on the blockchain. Our IOUs are redeemed, and we get our share of the real Bitcoin. The only time the high transaction fee occurs is when you open or close a channel to settle up want to transact with somebody you don't have a direct channel open with. Let's say you want to transact with Bob and pay him one Bitcoin. Bob does not currently have an open channel with you and you don't want to have to pay the fees to open another channel. It turns out that my first cousin Sam has an open channel with Bob. You could send the payments through our channel and use the channel I have open with Sam and finally from Sam to Bob paying me and Sam very small transaction fees for using our open channels. This is ideally how the network would work, hopping from individual to individual until your transaction meets the intended recipient. But it turns out if Sam isn't as fortunate as us, and our channel only has 0.5 bitcoins deposited, this won't work. There has to be enough loaded on each channel along the way for it to be used, and the network must find another route. Luckily, it turns out that Bob and you both eat at the same pizza shop regularly enough that you both have open channels. The pizza shop has plenty of Bitcoin in its channel and is one less hop than the last example. Bob gets paid, less fees for you, and the pizza shop gets a reward for providing a useful service. Everyone wins. Or so it would seem. A problem with the system is the requirement to preload every open channel you have ahead of time with what you assume will be the upper limit of your spending habits with that channel. It's more convenient to have one open channel and a large amount of Bitcoin to a well-connected party that consistently has more money than you so you can always route through. This is why hubs will naturally occur. A lightning hub is a node with enough channels open and enough liquidity available that by connecting them, you limit the amount of channels you need to personally open never have to worry about their balance, and reduce the amount of hops and fees required to make transactions. Unlike miners, who don't actually transfer value, these hubs will likely be classified as third-party settlement organizations, being subject to heavy financial regulation laws such as KYC and AML. Also, unlike on-chain transactions, there is a chance of theft in this system. 
if another party attempts to broadcast a channel in an old state, they can try to steal your Bitcoin if you can't catch them in time. For this, you will either need to run a full Bitcoin node that will always be online to monitor the transactions yourself or hire a third-party service to do this on your behalf. So, the Lightning Hubs will require to be set up for financial regulation and reporting laws, require massive amounts of liquidity to keep multiple well-funded open channels, offer fraud departments to watch the blockchain constantly and prevent theft, all while taking small fees for every transaction you route through them. Does this system sound familiar? Just replace the term open channel with checking account. These Lightning Network Hubs will be ran by the same financial institutions the Bitcoin was made to challenge. The banks aren't fighting Bitcoin because Bitcoin will be the new banking system. Bitcoin needed no middleman. There was no fraud to detect, no permission to give, no transaction to reverse, no fees to collect. So it had to be broken to need them. And the worst part is, you won't have a choice. Either give up your freedom and use the Lightning Network, or be subject to double or even triple-digit ever-increasing fees for every move you make on the blockchain. The truth is, the one megabyte blocks restricting Bitcoin are purposely kept there by the developers. The absurdly high fees and long waits create a demand for a solution. And the solution they give us is the banking industry. The block size restriction was placed as a temporary safeguard by Bitcoin's creator, Satoshi Nakamoto. As soon as the blocks were close to being full, it was to be raised again. Satoshi mysteriously left the project in 2010, but before he did, he left instructions on how to raise the block size and left Gavin Anderson in charge of the project. When Satoshi left, institutional money started to make its way in and take control, and a company, Blockstream, emerged. Over time, it happened that a large portion of the development team was part of or hired by this company, and when it came time for another block size increase, there was a portion of the developers that thought this was a bad idea. This just so happened to be the same group of developers that worked for Blockstream. The story of how Blockstream took over is a long and strange one, and I'll have to cover it in another video. But with massive amounts of censorship, Organized attacks and manipulation, Blockstream managed to take primary control over the development of Bitcoin and forced out any of the developers who opposed their choices and gave open arms to the ones whose opinions are aligned. Ever since then, the fees have exponentially risen. The confirmation times have grown from minutes to hours to days, and the merchants are dropping support at a rapid rate. The block size should have been raised long ago, It could be raised for years without any risk of centralization, giving us time to find other solutions. But it won't happen. Because Blockstream states that they plan to turn a profit by selling sidechains to businesses, allowing them to accept custom Bitcoin-backed chains that aren't subject to Bitcoin's high fees, taking small fees for every transaction, fixed monthly fees from the businesses, and selling the custom hardware needed to run them. This model is far more profitable if Bitcoin doesn't work properly. If the fees are low and no one wants their sidechains, then how will they pay the $74 million back to the corporations and big bankers who have invested? The ones who benefit from the lightning hubs. This amazing technology, designed to give freedom, stability, and power to the people around the world, has been ripped apart and destroyed for power, control, and profit. But it's okay, because we're going to the moon.